thank you for the kind introduction. And can you hear me well? Yeah. Is okay? So, um, so really speaking for uh, So uh, I saw in, in the book, uh, program book that you guys had, might already had a, a discussion on this technology as a discussion of uh, a team project today. So today, as a person in the field uh, uh, of generative technology, I will try to simply uh, introduce the technology and discuss some point that I encountered recently. Uh, where we, I started with, when I started to communicate with uh, non-scientists these days. So I will touch on the embryo engineering and stuff like that. that you got. I think you already had topics, so some of you already discussed yesterday. Uh, so today we'll talk about generative technology. Uh, we'll start with very boring slide like this. So, uh, you, you already know, I'm pretty sure that you guys are very well educated about digital information, but the information that's stored in DNA form, which is organized into a chromosome in the nucleus of a cell. So when we say we want to change genetic information, we want to go into the cell and into the nucleus, and then look for the chromosome and look for the location where we want to change, and then we change the genetic information. Um, so, but some of you who's not uh, majored in science are still we don't really think about genes so much, uh, even though we always hear about genes around the news and uh, the uh, internet. So, uh, but there are some times when we think about genes already uh, in our uh, real life. For example, when we see resemblance between father and mother, uh, father and not, not mother, father and daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, an, I mean, realistic example where we start to think about something shared between our, uh, our family. Not only the resemblance, but also the difference makes, makes us think about the genes. <laughs> you can see that I'm not having any shared genes with them. <laughs> more striking, more like more uh, uh, remarkable case of a difference we see are case of uh, genetic changes that makes really the uh, appearance difference. Like this case where albism are uh, observed even uh, uh, in humans and also animals, where changes in gene, even though they look alike, their color of the skin changes. And this phenomenon is uh, observed in animals also. This is a better case. I mean, these are also hereditary diseases, but it's not detrimental. But we all also know that there are detrimental cases of genetic defect, where it, uh, it brings these uh, hereditary genetic disease um, that cannot be cured with current technologies. But anyway, like when you see these type of examples and uh, my appearance and other people's appearance, um, we now think about what if we can change the information. We, we, what we have seen is that genetic difference makes the uh, phenotypic difference, the appearance difference. So now if we can change the information, can we change how we look, how we function? And how much, how far can we go with this? Uh, so we'll before we really go into those, uh, those uh, this is good timing where we start to discuss about this type of technology because uh, now we can read genome very well. Even though we have known that uh, DNA is the source of uh, genetic information, storage, storage of genetic information, it took a while uh, for people, for researchers to be able to really uh, read all genome of an organism and start to understand. But around 2001, the very first draft of human genome was released. Uh, the project uh, costed like billions of dollars and many, many people for tens of years. Uh, at that time, the technology that they built, with the technology they built, they said around this much of money, a lot of money, will take to sequence one more people at the time of 2001 technology. But after 15 years, with the uh, development of next generation sequencing technology, now, actually, we, I can pay $10,000 and $1,000 to a company like Macrogen or DNA Link in Korea to sequence all the genetic information of mine or yours. And we, during the development of this technology, not only the human, but also most of you know, valuable or like meaningful uh, living organisms genetic information has been sequenced. Uh, but when we say sequenced, it's not like we understand everything. It's more about the, reading the alphabet by A, B, C, D, E. 
like uh, by the uh, genetic information of ATGC, but with those information now we can start to understand genetic information more and more better. So we are, we do uh, we are accumulating a lot of genetic understanding, understanding a lot of genes and genetic changes with this information and technology. We can start to study gene function better, and also sometimes uh, now we, we are point with this technology and uh, health management. We can start to predict what one person's uh, health based on genetic information, like. You might already know the cases of, uh, 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 how do you say, the wife of Brad Pitt. <laughs> uh, Angela Jolie, yeah, where she removed her uh, breast uh, because of the possibility of, her high possibility of getting breast cancer because based on their gene profile. So more and more cases of like that called genetic counseling is coming. But if you think about uh, what we can do with what we understand, uh, prediction and precautions are very limited, very uh, uh, not active process. Now, with what we understand, we want to do application. We want to apply, apply what we understand to a new cell, to a new organism, to make a better uh, or bigger changes. By changing the information, we might be able to uh, develop new therapies for people. We might be able to do breedings to plants and animals to improve phenotypes of the uh, living organism. And there can be a lot of different things we might be able to do. But so far, changing genetic, genetic information has been very, very hard. One of the reasons why uh, it is, is I think because of stable DNA. Uh, genetic information, again, genetic information is stored in the form of DNA. But DNA is very, very stable chemical structure. It's very hard to change. Uh, normally, we wouldn't want DNA to change because that means change of genetic information in us, which will call, could cause genetic defect or cancers and stuff like that. But for us who want to now change actually uh, genetic information, DNA's uh, stable structure itself is a big barrier. Another big barrier actually realistically is the size of the genome. For example, human genome is composed of 3 billion ATGC nucleotide. Uh, this is an example of a uh, Human chromosome 3, where I bring 6, around 6,000 genetic information from the uh, chromosome 3, and then I have one T in red. I can change this, find it. Yes, actually, some of you can see it, but. Um, so, one, one out of 6,000 is hard to see, hard to find, even though the color is different. When you say gene changing genetic information with genome editing technology, it means you want to change one location from the uh, 3 billion nucleotide. So you really want to have some technology to find where you want to change. So current genome editing technology uses the principle of find and cut or targeted cleavage. So to, to overcome this barrier, one, if we can do this, if we can do find and cut where we want to change, that increases the fluid, fluidity of the genetic information here because the cut, uh, cleaved DNA structure is a damage to in, for the cell. So cells start to recover this cut DNA by repair process and researchers or more people can use this process to achieve genetic information change at this uh, cleaved locus. Uh, uh, things we can achieve is uh, something like we want to we can actually remove gene function at this locus, or we can recover uh, genetic information here, or we can just change it, or like we can add outside gene into the cut locus pretty efficiently. So there are a lot of different types of genome editing we can do with this. But still, the question is how to find the cut this location. There is a, that's when the NGR nucleus comes. Um, NGN nuclease is an artificial tool or enzyme that people can make to program to bind to one locus, the predetermined locus, and then cut that locus. There has been a vast development of different platforms of NGN nuclease so far. Uh, we can go into details and maybe it will take hours to explain, but we will today focus on CRISP, something called CRISPR nuclease because this is the hardest uh, enzyme uh, or engine nucleus these days. This is an example of uh, how fast it's getting popular. Uh, so Zinfigo nucleus, which is the first generation of, en of engine nucleus, which actually can do most of the things we are talking about, was developed around mid-2000. And then, so this is Google Trend, where each graph shows how many times these uh, words are searched in Google. 
and GFN, which was developed in 2000, mid 2005, uh, 2000, uh, which it started to be searched, but it didn't increase the popularity so so much. But in case of CRISPR or Cas9, which is a, a component of nucleus that we will talk about today, uh, so the fact that or the first paper or study that showed that this system can be used for the genome editing came out in January of 2013. And then since then, so you can see that here, 2013, since then, actually the search trend of CRISPR or Cas9 is uh, uh, surpassed the GFN already in a couple of months. Actually, there is a, something called TALAM, which is a second generation of uh, uh, engineering nucleus that came between GFN and CRISPR, but TALAM graph uh, was very low, or also because a lot of people misspelled talent with talent when they searched Google. That uh, I couldn't show the uh, uh, the graph here, but talent actually was a good, very good engineering nucleus platform, but it disappeared I and mean, it wore it it had their time too shortly to be popular before the CRISPR came along. So what is CRISPR about? So we'll see a little bit of a, a short video from YouTube. So uh, CRISPR is a bacterial immune system. So bacteria also has virus that invade, evade them. And they sometimes evade uh, bacteria by injecting their own DNA. CRISPR Cas system is a bacterial immune system where they are uh, their RNA component together with protein component can recognize the DNA from outside. Okay. Where they go to the, uh, the the DNA from outside and then they bind and recognize that, that they are from outside. And then when they are recognized as a foreign DNA, they will cut the foreign DNA so that they will not be able to function inside. But now, using this technology and using this system, scientists have engineered so that we can change how, uh, what it recognizes by changing by something called guide RNA so that it, it will recognize what we want to change, uh, cut. And then we change the protein a little bit so that it can, it can go into the nucleus of the uh, eukaryotic cell. Now we can use this nucleus and program the nucleus to cut where uh, we want to cut in mammalian cells and uh, plant cells and uh, human cells. Only when the RNA component and protein component recognize, the, uh, find the uh, uh, predetermined, pre-programmed target, it will cut DNA. And then again, okay, let me go a little bit back a little bit. So once the cell uh, uh, once the CRISPR system cut, where we want to cut in cell, like this, cell will recover the structure, but in the process, sometimes there are small mutations are introduced at the locus. This small mutation can cause the complete loss of the function at the lo gene located in this locus. So uh, this mutation will, uh, we can achieve gene function removal by it. But sometimes we want to change genetic information exactly to the uh, other genetic information we want to change. Then we can introduce something called donor DNA that, basic, that contains the genetic information we want to we want to change. Then this will hybridize to the double strand break that we introduced. And then this genetic information will be introduced into this loop. So it is kind of complex. But um, so basically what we do again is the by uh, introducing double strand break up or cut cleavage into the uh, predetermined locus with this CRISPR nucleus and then uh, change the information at the locus. Uh, I will just go talk about this a little bit more later. So, but just to, this is the hard, hardest part for some non-violence non to, to understand for today's talk, so just bear with me. Uh, just a couple of slides. I will just show again how it works a little bit. Because I want to do a little bit of a uh, artificial experiment later in the later slide. So CRISPR Cas system now that used for the uh, genome editing uh, composed of a protein called Cas9 protein in uh, gray, and then guide RNA that looks like this. This nucleus is used again to find and cut predetermined the locus. So how how to designate uh, uh, program this nucleus to cut where we want to cut? 
to understand, to, to know that we all know, uh, we all know, we all need to know how it works first. So CRISPR Cas system recognizes the where it comes by uh, uh, combination function of uh, two component either RNA and protein. The, the protein recognizes the, the protein that would normally used recognize two one in G G sequence nucleotide. This cannot be changed. However, the sequence that's recognized by the guide RNA, 20 base pair guide RNA, here, can be easily changed by the, by the researchers. So, when they meet their target site, first protein find look for the high, uh, GG sequence that bind to the DNA. And then they start to open DNA. And then if guide RNA sequence, sequence and target sequence perfectly matches, then to nucleate the cutting domain of Cas9 is activated and then they cut two sides of DNA so that they will be able to introduce double strand rate, which means a cut to the both strand of DNA. If this part is not matching, even though there is GG, they will not cut it, but they will just pop out. Now, the reason why I introduced all those details is, again, we want to do a little bit of experiment here. So let's say we want to cut some a gene called mouse PR, PRKBC. We want to, then we want to make a new CRISPR-Cas system, a uh, Cas nucleus for this uh, gene. So this is a small uh, genetic information part from this gene. So first we want to find where well, the potential CRISPR-Cas9 target site. Uh, in previous slide I mentioned that we can freely change this 20 base pair recognition site, but we cannot change this GG site. So that means to find potential CRISPR-Cas9 target site, we uh, we want to change this GG non-changeable uh, motif of CRISPR-Cas system. And then this GG will be recognized by the protein. The reason why there is two strands is because of the DNA double strand. And then with this, from this GG location, we can postulate the uh, RNA, uh, RNA uh, sequence re re uh, to be recognized by the RNA like this. We choose, we will choose four sites here. And then make high RNA here part, this part, to be to have this sequence or this sequence or this sequence or this sequence. And then with the four different high RNA and mixed with protein, we can actually try to cut this DNA. Let's see if it cuts or not. It looks a little complex uh, uh, for non-scientists, but just bear with me a little bit. So this is the last slide that will be the heart. So this this is the DNA that has this sequence. And then when we make four different uh, guide RNA for this three, four, and we can see that number two can remove this fragment, this sequence uh, DNA with this fragment disappeared, and then they cut completely this fragment. Number one cannot cut because the, it looks the same with the control. And then three and four partially cuts, but not completely cuts. So we, we, we saw that, we determined that number two guide RNA here uh, or CRISPR-Cas system is the best one to cut this sequence. The reason why we made this CRISPR system is because we wanted to make a mouse without this gene. To make it, the same either RNA and Cas9 protein we can inject into the embryo of a uh, mouse. Embryo is a one-cell stage of uh, 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 an, uh, one, one, one cell stage embryo where nucleus from the original information from the sperm and eggs are uh, combined. If we introduce a uh, CRISPR-Cas system into here, if a uh, gene from mom or father are cut and mutated, then the mouse born from the, developed from this mouse will be a mutant in the gene. So actually we did the experiment. So we transferred the surrogate mother to uh, this embryo to the surrogate mother. And then from the mouse that's born from the uh, injected embryo, we can find that a uh, mutant mouse that doesn't have this target gene at all. Uh, we knew that the removal of this gene from mouse uh, would result in the lack of immune cells, T cells and B cells. So this part and this part shows the immune cell, and then the mouse we made without the uh, uh, with CRISPR to not to have this gene doesn't have very little cell, all those no B or T cell that shows that we can remove this uh, gene from the mouse easily. Uh, so, um, 
this is a mouse, right? So in the lab, it works, but not only in the mouse, in the lab, actually, people have been applying this technology to very, very many different living organisms. Uh, starting from the budding yeast, one cell yeast that is used for the to make uh, bread, uh, Drosophila, C. elegans, and silkworm, uh, uh, and mouse and red rabbit, pig and cow, uh, monkey has been changing. And also, some plants like uh, rice, uh, barley, and corn, or orange, has been successfully genome edited with this system in lab. So, so it can be achieved in the lab and we can change the information in living organism. Uh, there's a company uh, with, this, uh, ability, uh, with this ability that we have. Uh, we're going to make an interesting product. So this is case, one case that we are working on currently. So this is related to the uh, enhanced muscle phenotype. Actually, there has been a news about this uh, product or the development uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago in Korean uh, uh, broadcast. But, so, um, this cow is called Belgian Blue. It's a, a cow strain that's actually widely uh, grown and sold in Europe and I think in the uh, uh, US also. Uh, this cow actually it's naturally occurring cow that shows this interesting phenotype where it has, even though it eats the same amount of food, they grow a little faster and then they grow more muscle than normal cow. So like hundreds of, hundreds of uh, like hundred or two hundred years ago, a uh, farmer in Europe saw this cow and then saw other cows that looks like this, and then they started to breed together of uh, these two to uh, make this train, uh, make, make this product. And now again it's uh, commercialized. Not only in cow, in, but also in human, dog, sheep, there are naturally occurring mutants that have similar phenotype, like this baby, very seven months old, can, it has a, a very, very big muscle. Uh, there are cases in sheep and other uh, animals also. And later, what people found is all these common phenotypes are caused by the mutation and in a gene called myostatin or MSTN. But in these cases, are these cases are uh, naturally occurring mutation. So somehow, this animal or people have ten, uh, 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 accidentally had a mutation in this gene, and then they have this phenotype. But we thought we, we thought that this is an interesting inter in industrial phenotype. But the, for pig, there has been no observation of this type of phenotype before. So there has been no MSTN mutant. Uh, that the mutant of uh, found before. So what we did is uh, we applied this technology to PE a couple years ago with collaboration with a professor at uh, uh, Yongbyon University in China. And we actually were able to make this P, uh, mutant PE. Uh, we mutated this gene in, uh, and into this small mutation into this locus where it will, uh, and even this small mutation of two base pair loss or four base pair loss will completely remove the function of this myostatin gene. The pig with this mutation, when they're just born, you can see that their uh, waist is uh, kind of looks like they, they worked out a lot. <laughs> and then once this later, you can see that their uh, uh, butts are a lot, uh, big, very, very big. <laughs> and actually, we have sacrificed a couple of them to see how it looks, in, uh, how their beef, uh, their meat looks. And then in, indeed, their uh, muscles are enhanced that their brown fat are reduced, and uh, actually white fat are reduced a lot, but their uh, content of white fat is not less effective, I mean, brown fat is less effective. So that means actually this peak, we sometimes call super peak or uh, double muscle peak, but they are, uh, they can be an interesting product for us as a company that uh, provide a phenotype of faster growth, even though they, even, when, even when they eat the same amount of food, they grow a little faster than normal peak. But also, uh, as a food source, they have more protein and muscle, less fat. So it will be healthier uh, diet source. Uh, so when I show these pictures to the people, sometimes they ask, have you eaten it? Like, how it tastes? I haven't, I haven't, I wasn't able to taste it yet. Uh, I think it will take a year or so for me to uh, tr try it. Uh, I will try it, but uh, I'm going to let you, I mean, maybe I will let you know in the next year or two, two years later. Uh, 
before I go into the next slide, I want to just touch the uh, about this matter up. So, is this cow uh, opening peak uh, GMO? There's a one question that people are a lot of uh, talks about a lot of times. Uh, so, GMO is a genetically modified organism. Uh, not for the animal, but for the plants. We hear about GMO and sometimes danger of GMO in our internet and communications uh, broadcast. As a scientist, I don't think normal GMOs are that dangerous, but still there are a lot of people worried about it. Uh, and it's kind of hard to really persuade. But again, is this GMO? In principle, because we change the gene of this animal, they are GMO. In principle. But they are not GMO. Uh, in legal point, we believe. The reason why we say that we can say that is because GMO are defined as an organism that has a genetic structure or information that cannot occur naturally. Uh, so the normal GMO we talk about in plants, where like they are they acquired resistance to the pesticide, pesticide and stuff like that. They are made by transferring a gene from an insect or other organism into this plant. Those type of genetic change doesn't occur naturally. Only when people apply this, it can happen. But as you see here, uh, mutation we introduced is not introducing a, a DNA material from outside to inside. What we did is we actually removed small pieces of DNA that pig originally had. And then this small mutation can uh, bring this spectacular, spectacular phenotype. But this type of small mutations happens naturally in our, uh, in our body also. Every day in our body, this type of mutation happens. So this mutation cannot be discerned from the naturally occurring mutation. So by definition of GMO, this type of animals or plant, if you make it like this, wouldn't be a GMO in some countries. So there are debates by the government and scientists and also NGOs if you want to call this GMO or not. We believe this might not be GMO, but we don't know. How it, how it comes out is more of a social social or government determined uh, discussion, not scientific discussion. Another is aspect of uh, why we think this is not GMO is because uh, uh, this is a interesting, not interesting, but like another story, but for plant, people have been using a, a traditional breeding technology of ionizing radiation or radiation of plant, which means you radiate a plant, which will create a lot of double stranded cleavage in the genome here and there, like hundreds of or thousands of mutation sites in plant. And then they find the mutant that uh, shows the phenotype that they want. And then they bring it, bring it up, and then they call it as a breeding, traditional breeding, not GMO. Even though they're introducing mutation that looks like this in thousand places, they are called non-GMO. Only when you introduce new gene, deep gene into one locus, they call GMO. So I think the technology like this are more of an advanced version of ionizing radiation where we determine where we want to uh, introduce a small, naturally occurring looking mutation. So, so I mean, this, uh, there are, this is another point that we, will, we could think about as a new technology brings a new regulation and new changes, uh, need for the changes in government or like, regulation. And, but after all, I mean, people say there will be 9 billion people in 20 to 30 years in Earth. And a lot of people are predicting shortage of food. And I saw, I was in a lecture by the 3D printing uh, personnel, like a specialist. And then they said they are making a 3D, 3D printer for the meat. Okay. So I next time, so the next time was my lecture. So I asked if you want to eat in 20 years, if you want to eat uh, meat from the 3D printer or like this. <laughs> so meat, free, meat from the 3D printer makes this very natural. Looks very natural, right? <laughs> so, so I mean, there are a lot of ways to go to, with this. But another, this is a, a, a very uh, visual example of what we can do. But also.
also it, it brings a lot of different issues that we need to think about as a as a scientist or a student here. Not only for the animal, uh, this technology because it cuts and it changes DNA, it can apply it can be applied to a lot of different areas. Uh, but I think most people will be interested in therapeutic fields. So I'll discuss a couple of different examples of how it is being applied in a therapeutic area. One prominent example of, 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 of current application of genetic, uh, genome editing technology for therapeutic development is for AIDS. So HIV virus which cause AIDS are, uh, uh, and also I mean AIDS are called managed disease currently, but there is no cure of AIDS yet. But there are interesting phenomena uh, in some population in Europe here. There are people resistant to HIV, so they are resistant to AIDS. But the reason why they are resistant to AIDS is because of genetic mutation they have. There are gene called CCR5, which is used as a gateway for the HIV to go into their target cell, high plus cell. Interestingly, there are some populations in Europe that doesn't have CCR5, they have mutations in CCR5 gene, they are healthy, and additionally, they are resistant to the HIV because HIV cannot go into their target cell because of the lack of CCR5 as the gateway gene. Uh, it is not clear why only there in, in, in Europe they have this population, not in other places, but interesting uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's proven or not, but uh, some people say the lack of CCR5 might have uh, uh, rendered the uh, resistant to the pest in the Europe before. So maybe there has been a natural selection by the pest for this genotype of loss of CCR5 gene in Europe hundreds of years ago. And then they, the population who was resistant to the pest at that time now is uh, resistant to the ABC. So this is good. But another more, more interesting example is Tim. His, his name is Timothy Brown, and uh, he's, he's a German uh, patient. He was a German patient with AIDS, and a lot of AIDS patients develop leukemia, the blood cancer also. So when you have blood cancer, you will what you will get is a hematopoietic stem, stem cell transplantation, or uh, switch. So he he also got. Uh, him, uh, stem cell transplantation. Uh, good for him that the donor of uh, the stem, stem cell was a person without CCR5. So when he got stem cell pl transplantation, he was cured from the leukemia, but also he's completely cured from AIDS because now his immune cell doesn't have CCR5 at, at all. So a company in uh, uh, US uh, with zinc finger technology and the first generation antinucleus, but is applying this principle to a patient by drawing the blood from the AIDS patient, then use nuclear engineer nucleus to remove CCR5 gene from the patient's blood, and then put it back to the patient, so that we can actually replicate this uh, and then develop this uh, this principle into the therapeutic application. Another example is hemophilia. Uh, some of you might know hemophilia is a rural disease where there is a uh, mutation in uh, blood clogging, uh, uh, clogging factors. Yeah. A lot of uh, hemophilia are caused by the, something called inversion, where this gene looks like this normally, but patient's DNA looks like this because uh, well, from here to here are inverted like this. Then this gene cannot function. That's why they lose the function of factor A, something called factor A, and then uh, there is a no factor A, then there is a hemophilia A. There, had, there was a paper from Korean research group where uh, they what they did is that they uh, draw cell from the actually urine from the patient, the AIDS patient, and then they made a stem cell called the IPS cell. And then they use nuclease to cut both sides of the inverted locus. And some of the cells with both cut will have a in reverted, inverted again to make this normal structure. And then from this cell with the recovered structure, they can actually make a functional liver cell that will make a uh, vector aging. 
So now we can we can uh, change genetic from a genetic mutation that cause uh, cause a genetic disease uh, directly in human uh, human cell and um, patient cells to recover the phenotype. Because I think the time is limiting. I think I want to go into a little more into more interesting parts. Uh, fast. Uh, so what I only want to say in the next couple of slides is that uh, where we can go more, like another way to cure hemophilia, even we can actually leave structure like this and then simply add uh, normal, normal uh, factor eight gene into cell, into the liver uh, by virus and angiogenic nuclease. Uh, this type of system is interesting because we, this is basically, we, we are, we, now we are saying we are curing the, the genetic disease by adding the normal copy of the mutated gene. But what we think is, what I think in 20 to 30 years later, maybe 10 to 20 years later, people might start to use this system to get to healthier. For example, we can actually use this system to add vitamin synthesizing gene to our liver or the amino acid or detox related gene up to our liver. So instead of actually taking pills, the vitamin pills every day, or taking other type of health supplement every day, we might be able to just add gene to us to get more healthier. And then another uh, more interesting, more, more needed uh, application for me is that uh, adding alcohol dehydrogenase so that I can drink more. <laughs> Another scientist is in also suggesting an interesting of, uh, idea where uh, they, will, they are trying to uh, recover mammoth with this uh, technology. Uh, there are another researchers who say they will recover uh, mammoth by bringing the frozen mammoth cell and then transfer it into the embryo of uh, uh, elephant. And this, this process is called Somatic nuclear cloning, uh, but I don't think that would work because the cells of mammals, even though they are frozen, is because it's thousands of years old, tens of thousands of years old. They will have fragmented DNA. I don't think they will can, they can recover clone of uh, that animal. But with that DNA, okay, they can do it. They can actually still sequence it. They can get genetic information of mammals from it. And then what then what what they can do is they can compare it to the elephant. And then change, uh, find where is difference between elephant and mammoth. So now, in interest of, uh, instead of uh, recovering mammoths uh, from the mammoth cell, we might be able to apply genetic information, genome editing technology to change elephant to mammoth. Uh, this is more, uh, frankly, this is more of a science fiction, even for me. <laughs> so, but, but, I mean, it might happen in tens of 10 years, 10 or 10 years later. Last point I want to talk about is where are we going to go, <laughs> right? So, uh, can we be better human later? But how by applying this information, I today get to embryo? So, to answer your question, the you know, a paradox comes, ethical paradox comes at this point. Some genetic disease, Hemophilia actually, we don't need to go into go to embryo to cure it, but some genetic disease actually need genome editing in embryo to cure it. It cannot be cured once the baby are born. But the technology that enables uh, genome editing therapy in embryo can bring designer baby or eugenics crop issue because the same technology will be used for embryo genome editing uh, therapy or embryo designer baby. So, what is ethical? I mean, some, a lot of people think this, this type of application are not ethical, but what is ethical? Like, if you have technology, is it okay to let, uh, not using this technology for the genetic uh, patient who has the genetic disease, but that road will open designer baby. So, I don't know what's the better way to go. But interesting uh, survey was there uh, where two questions were asked, uh, uh, asked actually, not this one. So first, actually, I just want to ask you if you think, if techn uh, technically possible, do you agree on genome editing therapy for patient? And then, another actual question sur survey was about 
once that is done, do you agree on applying genome editing to embryo to make more intelligent baby or to make your baby healthier? Here, healthier means not cure of the disease, but uh, you will, the baby that will be healthier and then will not get disease more, I mean, or has less, uh, less possibility of diabetes or cancer, stuff like that. So will you apply this technology to your baby if this is technologically you know, uh, possible? This is an example of survey in the US that was published in uh, the uh, MIT uh, uh, Technology Review a couple of months ago. Uh, a lot of people, actually, around half of people thought that they would like to apply this technology to their baby if technology, technology is probably possible to reduce risk of serious diseases. But still, a lot of people are uh, opposing the possibility of using it to make your, their baby more intelligent. But this is just current snapshot of people's like, opinion. And in five years, 10 years later, when these technologies are becoming more common to the people, this might change. Then can we go to the X-Men <laughs> by applying this technology? I'm not sure like, uh, if we can do that. But frankly, for me, the currently, uh, even personally, uh, for me, I, I have no actual opinion about if it, is it OK to apply this technology to human embryo, even though this is technologically uh, possible. Um, I think that's a Pandora's box in a way. But once it starts to open, I think a lot of people will start to do this uh, experiment in their clinic. And then uh, there can be very interesting uh, development. I'm, I'm saying interesting as a really interesting, but not good or bad. So uh, just one more minute. Uh, as a scientist, uh, I have been involved in development of engineering nucleus for like eight years. So I was working in this field since 2007. As a scientist, I was interested in just developing these tools and then see what we can do in the lab. And then only recently, with the CRISPR development, and people started to get interested in this technology from the mass media, media and internet, and normal people. Only when that's when I started to think about this type of problem. I, ne I never thought that I'm causing this problem to the world. But actually, later I found out my work in this field for five, ten, ten years actually started to bring this problem to. Uh, to the uh, world. So I think scientists need to aware of what they are doing more, uh, more uh, when, when they are actually doing it. Uh, and also I look for the, a quote that's uh, appropriate to end this uh, uh, session. Uh, actually, Robert uh, W. White is not a scientist, but, but actually he's a sculptor. A sculptor so, uh, but uh, his quote was uh, interesting for me to Technology shapes society and society shapes technology. So far, I mean, for five to ten years, I was in, interested in how to develop technology only, but as a, as a case of GMO or embryo, now I'm meeting or uh, talking with a lot of uh, people, non scientists people, to uh, uh, how to use this technology and how fast or how, what type of strategy we can actually use to use the, uh, this technology, apply this technology in society or in our uh, development of our product what's acceptable or not. Uh, sometimes we need to wait for people to accept people we make. Um, that's what I'm finding out. So uh, I mean, I'm personally experiencing an interesting, uh, I'm, I'm doing, I get, uh, in the process of getting an interesting uh, experience right now. Uh, so actually, this is the last slide I prepared. And hopefully, it was not too boring for you guys. And then uh, I'll be happy to get questions uh, thank you for your wonderful speech, Dr. Kim. We will now pro proceed to a 15-minute Q&A session. We have prepared a microphone around the hall. Thus, please feel free to raise your hand to ask questions to Dr. Kim.
그 CCR5 결, CCR5 밀셉트라 걔네 결함 있는 거에 뭐 원인이 있는 거예요? 네? 결함이 있는 원인이요? 네, 결함이 있어가지고 네. 그걸 관해서 그 HIV 바이러스, HIV 바이러스를 저항할 수 있는 거기에만 원인이 있는 거지 아니 제가 그 HIV 바이러스 관해서 그 거기 원래 숙주 세포 안에 네. 그 아포백 3G가 아 그런 여러 가지 메커니즘이 있는 건 사실이죠. 그래서 근데 어그 가장 HIV가 먼저 걸리는 그 가장 들어올 때 가장 먼저 메이트웨이가 이렇게 들어오기 때문에 네. 이게 없는 사람들은 잘안 걸린다고 알려져 있고요. 다른 진 때문에 다른, 다른 진 때문에 HIV가 안 걸리는 파퓰레이션이 있는지에 대한 스터디 많이 되지 않고 아프리카 같은 경우도 최근에 뭐 이제 한국에서 논문 나오고 있던 거 봤는데 그 제일 어떤 체인지 때문에 이제 HIV가 안 걸리는 파퓰레이션이 있다 없다에 대한 케이스는 잘 모르겠어요. So the question was, is, is there any other uh, genetic variations that confers a, a, a resistance to the HIV or AIDS? And I, I didn't answer that in a long, in a long explanation. Uh, I think the reason why people know about CCR5 is because already, because of, again, possibly because of the past, there are big populations of people without CCR5 in Europe. So population study or like, um, the population study is uh, very easy for this, po uh, this population, but other genetic mutation, just naturally occurring mutations are very, very rare. So it will, it will be very hard to make a case for it. Uh, uh, so it will take much longer time. But in, uh, in Europe, some part, part of Europe, there are around 1% of the, pe the population in North Europe that doesn't have this gene at all. And so it's much more case studies with this gene and resistance to the HIV in this case. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Kim, and I really enjoyed your lecture. And uh, uh, so I I understand that CRISPR that CRISPR this technology is, re is a really powerful one. And uh, I also know that your company Toolgen owns one of the three major patents in the world, which is uh, significant because considering the power how powerful this technology is. Having a, a patent of using this technology is is giving you giving your company a more power power uh, to actually you uh, manipulate how the technology works. So uh, I wanted to question uh, who owns this technology actually. I mean, is this just another technology that gives power to more uh, rich people or? Uh, Socially higher, uh, you know, who are in the socially higher structures, or is it something else that can provide a more democratic way to use this technology? Okay, so uh, I want to say it's mine. Better <laughs> 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 uh, situation again. So your question about who owns this technology seems to be in some part uh, realistic, but also in some part society, society issue uh, in 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 aspect of society. In realistic uh, patent situation, is pretty complex. As you said, there are three or four patent uh, holders that will be fighting for the ownership of this technology. Uh, it's important for us, but might not be important for the society, actually. Uh, uh, who knows, I mean, how the patent uh, fight will end up, like maybe none of the patent become important in 10 years. Uh, and it'll, again, it'll take around 10 years for this technology to really impact if it works. So, uh, I don't know, I mean, how it do go. Uh, societal societal, uh, societal uh, issue, who owns this technology? Uh, some, some lawyers tell me that because of because this technology's impact is so broad, and the current patent that we're talking about a really, really broad technology that could limit use of this technology in any uh, area, uh, some, some patent lawyer uh, advice or Credit that uh, this technology wouldn't really hold as a patent because of because the implication is too broad. Uh, one or two party to have this patent is really will could end up limiting again, as you said, limiting the use of this technology for uh, uh, for one or two uh, entity, uh, economic uh, interest only. Uh, 
uh, which is a, not a good thing for the world. So, peace and peace not only consider the <coughs> novelty or like advance and stuff like that. Also, they also think about societal um, so, uh, issues, uh, societal issues. So, again, not sure how it will hold. Uh, in terms of economic issue that you talk about, like it will the patent or like ownership of this technology could limit uh, like beneficiary of this technology to riches or like uh, that's uh, not limited to this technology. Frankly, uh, when for example when these technologies are applied as a therapeutics, uh, it will be combination of gene therapy, gene editing and also cell therapy technology and a combination of everything. These new platform technologies are usually very, very expensive. There are, uh, it's another example, but there are uh, cell gene therapy that's coming up, not related to this technology, but called CAR T-cell therapy. It's gene modified T-cell therapy, which is working like a magic for the ca some cancer patient. But people predict the price of this technology to be around $150,000. Or there are some gene therapy that's, uh, that just came out last year, uh, whose inject one injection is around $1 million. Uh, so with, even without this emerging technology, new platform technology therapies are very, very expensive. Uh, it's more of a government issue to solve how to provide these therapeutics to patients but also benefit or, uh, or compensate pharmaceutical companies who develop it. Uh, so genomic technology, uh, therapies with genomic technology will be expensive, that's for sure. Uh, enabling it to be used for it, a lot of people are more of government or government issue. And not only for this technology, I think this, this will be brought up uh, a lot in the next couple, some years, not only because of this technology, but also because of normal gene therapy, normal cell therapy, this, in the line to come up. Hello. <clears throat> um, thank you for your lecture. And I was just wondering whether it's not possible to change the um, configuration for the CCR5 receptor in order to prevent the HIV virus attaching to the receptor, or whether you can't um, insert inhibitors so that ligands are already attached to the receptor, preventing the HIV virus to attach to the receptors. So after people found out that CCR5, uh, actually after they found, uh, found out that most of CCR5 confers resistance to the AIDS virus, people started to develop uh, therapeutics for HIV in many different ways. There are small chemicals or antibodies that again, I mean, that binds to this CCR5 or first before HIV comes, so that they will stop, uh, uh, prevent binding of HIV 2.2. Two. Uh, uh, but there are there, there are more of a cure, right? There are more type of cure. Uh, uh, the, which means uh, once a patient has CCR5 in their system. Uh, a lot of them has a dormant virus that's not activated yet. So until that is removed, you will take the drug again and again and again. So that's why it's hard to really cure the, uh, cure the disease. Uh, the good thing about changing gene of a cell or patient is that it's permanent. Once you, once you have it, you have no CCR5. So you don't need to take the drug anymore every day. Even, even though provirus comes up, wake up, they cannot go into the immune cell, so they will not function. So the type of uh, genetic uh, uh, therapy that is enabled by genetic information, uh, genetic technology, is uh, interesting in terms of uh, it can be actually cure a permanent cure with one uh, one procedure. Possibly, it's, it will take a long time. But again, because of this interaction between HIV and CCR, there has been a lot of different types of uh, drug that has been developed based on this observation, but none of them are or uh, as successful as people expect this to be.
Thank you for good lecture. And I have two I have two questions. And first one, uh, this principal Cas9 system is from bacterial adaptive immune system, isn't it? And uh, I wondering that uh, because it is bacterial system, if we uh, use it for human body, is uh, is there any problem from uh, different species? And the other question is why only bacteria have this kind of additive immune system? Is there other additive immune system to protect from invasive of the uh, other DNA? Okay, two good questions and very scientific. First question is about applying a foreign species system into human, possibly, right? Uh, so let's think about, think about ways to apply this technology for human therapy. One is to bring out cell from the patient, apply this technology, and then bring it back to the patient. In this case, even though cells are applied with the crispr cas system, by the time where the cells are going back to the cell, they will not have crispr cas anymore. Be because crispr cas need to be expressed in the cell only in short time, they will introduce mutation or change genetic information, but they will go away. And then, but they will still have genetic information, genetic change that CRISPR introduced. And then when they go back, they have mutation or genetic cure, but no CRISPR. In this case, there is no problem. But I introduced a case where we use virus to actually bring CRISPR cas system into the body, to change the gene in body. In that case, the suggestion you had is an issue. It, because if our body has never met this protein before, it could bring immune response. Uh, so that's one of the barriers or like potential complications people are predicting of applying this technology into the in vivo gene therapy, genome editing therapy. So that's one of the questions that I want to see in near future. Actually, trying uh, trying to design some experiment for that. Uh, next next question is: uh, Is there other uh, why why CRISPR is only in bacteria? I think uh, so. For bacteria, invaders there are, are very simple, but invaders are injecting DNA or RNA into bacteria in most cases. So their adaptive immune system need to be against DNA or RNA. That's why CRISPR is the best way to deal with uh, invaders for bacteria. But for animals like us, or plants like, I mean, metazoan system, uh, invaders like bacteria are coming into our body as a form of bacteria, not DNA only, right? So the adaptive system we have is using antibody or T cell, cell. So we do have adaptive immunity system as an antibody or T-cell or other immune system, it's not that they are not just using DNA to recognize invaders, but they are using, uh, recognizing uh, uh, foreign protein or foreign uh, uh, glycosylation and stuff like that. So we do have our own adaptive immune system uh, more functional for us, more suitable for us. And it's um question for my first question and uh, you said uh, uh, in eject a cell and CRISPR Cas9 and after that remove the Cas9 and inject our body but uh, in the point of one cell uh, human DNA system and uh, human DNA is, is like linear and bacteria is circular like this uh, uh, in the cell uh, bacteria and human cell is very different, so uh, I'm curious that uh, is it possible <laughs> in only one cell? Uh, So you can think about it like um, 
enzymes and so they uh, so one question we had initially we, when we saw this system is that because again bacteria has DNA structure and human DNA structure is a little different uh, in mammalian cell or the higher eukaryotic cell there are something called nucleosome uh, chromosome uh, bacterial DNA usually has a very simple DNA structure only DNA naked DNA type usually but in human or higher eukaryotic case there are composed of a very complex structure of protein DNA uh, pack, compact structure we didn't know if we can access, access this system, uh, this structure of eukaryotic DNA. It worked. So once it, we saw it works, I mean, we don't question uh, why it works. I mean, basically, uh, it works. Um, DNA, but when you, if you think about DNA that bacteria has and we have, it's not different. So as long as they can access to DNA, it will be able to cut DNA. So to enable uh, eukaryotic cell genome editing, what we needed to do is to make this CRISPR system to be able to go into the nucleus, which is not natural function of the CRISPR, because CRISPR, the bacteria doesn't have nucleus. So we added some fragment that makes the CRISPR cut system go into the nucleus of eukaryotic cell so that it will be able to access to DNA where, because the DNA is within the nucleus. But once we have it, we didn't have any problem to enable uh, DNA cutting. Um, And I have a question. Uh, I believe that there are several proteins for DNA splicing similar to the CRISPR system. Uh, is there is only one specific pre protein used, or are there many proteins used in the CRISPR-Cas9 system? And if there is only one protein being used, could you tell us why? Okay. So, uh, CRISPR, uh, First, uh, there are a lot of different nucleases. I mean, nucleases is a DNA cutting enzyme. There are a lot of different nucleases. The reason why CRISPR is widely used is because they are easily programmable. So they, the, the, the reason that uh, they can, we can easily change where, where it comes. Uh, uh, there are, in eukary in, even in bacterial kingdom, there are a lot of different CRISPR types. Uh, in broader type, there are one, two, three. The one we are using is CRISPR type two. The reason why we are using CRISPR type cut system type 2 is because usually CRISPR cut system are composed of multiple protein. Each type has multiple cut protein. But type 2 CRISPR system need only cas 9 protein, one cas 9 protein to enable cutting event. Other CRISPR types require multi-protein complex to enable cutting. So in terms of uh, uh, engineering, Point, it's much simpler to use type 2 because again we, it, have, it contains Cas9 protein that has all the functions within. So compared to other uh, Cas9 Cas proteins from other CRISPR system, Cas9 is very very weak because it needed to have all different functions within one protein. Uh, so another so another way to I mean so this is an answer to your question why one protein is enough for this system because it has multiple domains that enables uh, functions that needed to cut DNA within one protein. Last question there. Uh, due to our time constraints, we can have one more, just one more question. I heard your presentation where, and I um, I have one question. I think using this technology have something dangerous in human diversity. Uh, for example, we know some genes which causing uh, cancer, and we use this tech, we can replace this gene with original gene. And, but in the future, if some disease target this gene, then many forests die. Uh, what's your opinion about this? So, uh, this is uh, an interesting question, I think. Uh, uh, we can. Uh, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, first, like those type of again, human embryo editing is a 
technical, technically not possible yet. So we, we will need to wait. But theoretically, if we have this technology, uh, those are questions that a lot of people ask. But my question is, if a lot of people already think about this question, will people use it in that way? Uh, if you think about it, actually, this technology can be used to remove genetic diversity, but also it can be used to create genetic diversity. People, if, uh, my prediction is that if actually people start to apply this technology to human, to improve human, uh, people will be wise enough not to make the genetic information too simple, but people will be able to apply some good genetic information into the people, but might be able to add another genetic diversity into human, so that if some kind of diversities are uh, uh, maintained. Uh, so it's more about, this technology will not limit the diversity of genome. People will, right? So people already knew, know about, think about this problem, so I don't think people will be uh, uh, using this technology in that way. Okay, thank you very much.